How do we explain an abstract idea? Well, analogies are helpful because they allow us to take something abstract and map it to something concrete. In, in that way, we can explain, um, for example, like when we're trying to explain how electricity moves through a wire, we might use the analogy of water moving through a pipe. Anecdotes are also helpful for explaining abstract ideas. Think about the classic story of the apple falling on Isaac Newton's head as a way to understand how gravity functions in the world around us. So visually, we also use analogies and anecdotes. We can think of a chart as a visual analogy where we denote an increase of something uh, as a movement upwards and change over time from left to right. Pictures and illustrations are visual anecdotes that explain a larger story. A picture is worth a thousand words. So oftentimes we think of science and art as opposites, but in reality they're more like two sides of the same coin, trying to understand and explain abstract ideas. I work at the Complex Systems Center at the University of Vermont. Complex systems uh, exist in a wide range of different fields. We can kind of think of them as nodes and linkages or networks in a um, system. So when we're trying to make sense of these networks, uh, while they may be qualitatively different, they have some quantitatively similar characteristics. So the way in which a contagion spreads through a school system may be similar actually to the way that a meme or a hashtag spreads across social media. Or the way that a cascading failure causes a power grid blackout may be mathematically similar to the way that cancer metastasizes in cells. So the Complex Systems Center is this interdisciplinary research hub where students, faculty, and staff from a whole bunch of different um, fields of study come together and talk about these similar phenomena. So I'm a data visualization artist at that Complex Systems Center, and there are really two different kinds of visualizations that I create. The first is the communicative graphic. So that's something where we've found some finding that we want to share with the scientific community. And so we create a graphic to publish, say, in a scientific journal or on a blog post. But then there's this other kind of graphic, the one that I really get excited about, and that's the exploratory graphic. And that's where we have this complex network, we have this huge data set, and we don't really know what we're going to find in it. We just need to start pulling it apart and making sense of the relationships. So to back up a little bit, I'm not a data scientist. I studied graphic design, and when I left school, I went to go work as a designer, and I was programming those annoying uh, display banner ads where the car drives across the top of your browser. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, I started thinking about how I, as an artist, was using technology. And I ended up going back to school to Champlain College, where they have an emergent media master's program. And in that program, they um, really focus on interdisciplinary exploration um, and celebrate curiosity and playfulness. So today, I'd like to share with you two stories from my time in that program. So, Synesthesia is this weird phenomenon where people will map one sense to another. So they may be able to, say, hear a smell or taste a color. And I have synesthesia for numbers and letters and days of the week. So when I memorize a phone number, I actually think about the colors of those numbers as I'm remembering it. I'm not really sure why the associations are the way that they are. Uh, it's just kind of the way that my brain works. So I was trying to learn how to play music. And I always get really lost with sheet music, because they're just like black dots on a white page, and they start swimming in front of my eyes, and I can't really focus. And so I wondered if it was possible to kind of induce a different kind of synesthesia in myself. Um, composers throughout history have had synesthesia, where they map a sound to a color. 
And so I started experimenting with a color scheme where the C note was red, the E was yellow, and the G was blue. I painted the fretboard of my guitar and I started learning how to play as best I could. Um, so in order to test my color system, I was curious what existing compositions would look like. So this one here is Ode to Joy and it sounds like this. And this was the picture that I kind of generated with an algorithm that matched that song. And I really enjoyed this picture because I felt like it kind of captured the, the beautiful like joy and rainbow of that song. So to test it on another piece, also by Beethoven, this one is for Elise, and it sounds like this. So looking at these two pieces by the same composer side by side, I really felt like joy at the fact that there were, um, the attitude of the two different pieces was kind of captured by these illustrations. So I continued on my uh, visualization track and uh, I started creating illustrations of um, chord diagrams. So this is like how um, harmonics work when you're playing a chord on the guitar. And I showed these to friends of mine who were musicians, and they got really excited. They started showing me um, other musicians and uh, visualizations that I should take a look at. One sort of unintended consequence of this was I found that my existing synesthesia for letters was being supplanted by the um, new system that I had created. So while I previously thought of like the letter D as pink, I started thinking of it as orange because I had mapped the D note to the letter D. Um, so I realized that what I needed to do instead was really just map the sound to the color and abandon the letter system that we had existing for notes. So I then also painted my electric keyboard and I started quizzing myself. So I'll press down the key with my eyes closed and I'll try and guess what color it will be. Um, I've gotten pretty good at like C and E. I keep mixing up B and F for some reason. Um, but this was a sort of fun project that was a visual analogy for a um, complex abstract idea. So another story I'd like to tell you is about uh, when I was preparing to leave graduate school and uh, my fellow students and I were talking about where we wanted to live after graduation. And we were thinking, oh, well, it would be really cool to do a, a data-based project. And what if we could answer this question of what makes a place livable with data? So at first, we started thinking about, well, well, where do we, what kinds of criteria do we want? We thought about affordability, and we pulled um, some data about cost of living and incomes in areas. But then we started thinking, well, wait, is the most affordable place really the best place to live? Um, a place with high incomes and low cost of living may have a low cost of living because the only food available is fast food. Um, so we started asking all of these other questions, like what about the walkability? What about the music scene? What about green spaces in the area? Originally, we thought that our process would go something like this. We would find a good question, and then we would find an answer, what the most livable place is, and that we could share that opinion with others, and then maybe we would raise awareness about what makes places livable, we could change people's attitude towards those places, and maybe even cause more young people to move to an area they might not have considered before. That was kind of ambitious for a summer project. So instead we decided to focus on just finding good questions. This was the most fun part for us, was asking like, well wait, but what about this? What about that? And then maybe a little bit of finding good answers, but they were all gonna be subjective answers because livability is a different criteria for different people. So we created this exhibit called, but what about, which was a prototype of an exhibit because the idea is that we could um, have this exhibit in different locations and the kinds of questions that people were asking would be different. 
So we created this interactive map where you could take a whole bunch of different data sets and overlay them. So um, potentially income might be blue and then cost of living would be yellow. And so areas with a high income and a high cost of living would be green. And then you could maybe add a third layer onto that of the poverty rate in an area. And so this allowed people to kind of create their own custom maps um, that emphasized the things that they were most interested in. We also had two displays that were sort of randomly cycling through these maps that we had found. And this created a really beautiful teaching moment at one point. We had um, a map on the top showed the hours of television watched on average per household by state. And then the map on the bottom showed the results of the 2016 presidential election. And so there was a student in front of this display saying, well, of course, that's the way that that state voted because look how much television they watch. And so we had a really beautiful teaching moment of correlation is not causation. And so just because two things are happening simultaneously in the same location doesn't necessarily mean that one caused the other. So then my favorite part of the exhibit was that we invited people to come in and write their own questions on the walls. Um, this kind of created a really beautiful aesthetic that um, invited people into the exhibit who were just sort of walking through the college and seeing all of these questions and then having questions of their own. So in my work as a data visualization artist, a lot of times um, I say, let's go back to the drawing board. Anyone who, who has ever spent time with a five-year-old knows that they're constantly asking, like, why? But why? And I'm always that person at the Complex system Center that's asking, like, well, wait, what does that mean? What does that mean? Can we boil it down to stick figures or to visual hypotheses of what we think our chart might look like before we actually feed any data into it? Um, because of the interdisciplinary nature of a lot of the research that we do, we also wonder sometimes, um, could we take a chart of one thing and then sort of port it over into a totally different discipline? Um, so this is just an example of a, a graphic of volatility-inducing mechanisms where uh, the only thing that I've changed is the labels. Just a fun experiment. Um, so I've shared two anecdotes with you, and now I'd like to share one analogy. If we think about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM fields, as the stem of a plant, then the arts can be the leaf, free to kind of blow in the wind and respond to the environment while still remaining grounded. And I think that this is a tremendous opportunity for growth.